And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. Hello, friends. This is Tex Mars. Welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. Well, today we're going to be looking at a subject that oh, just gives me a lot of uh, a lot of pain, a, a lot of discomfort, I guess, to use a nice word. But it's something that we all need to look at, we need to understand, and we, we need to dwell on in our mind. You know, the Bible tells us to look at things that are pure and good, and of course, that's true. We need to look at things as as well as we can, rosy, happy, be contented in our lives. I, I think with Jesus Christ, a person is naturally that way. And yet Paul said, the Apostle Paul said, but we are not ignorant of the devices of the devil. We're not ignorant of the devices of the devil. And, of course, Paul and even Jesus warned us many times of false prophets, uh, of of, of People who come as angels of light, but are in fact Luciferians and devils. And this world belongs to them, not us. So Christians need to understand. The, the, the Apostle John said, we know that we are of God. And the whole world lieth in wickedness. Now there, there, is, there are two parts to that statement. And how many days have I dwelled over that state and thought about what John said? We know that we are of God. You can know if Jesus is in your heart. You can fake it, of course. You can pretend. You can be a, a false Christian. You can be a, a devil worshiper, even pretend you're a Christian. But John wasn't talking about those kinds of fakers and hoaxes. He was talking about true Christians. We know that we are of God. You can know. And there's an and there. He combines that with something else. And the whole world lieth in wickedness. So when we look on the world, we can see the monstrosity that the devil, the Satan, has turned this world into. And we can't deny that fact. And we can't, you know, we cannot escape it. You know, when Satan took Jesus into the desert, he took him to a very high place, and he, he looked out, and he could see the whole world. I suppose that was in his imagination, but the devil says, see all these things, all these great kingdoms and cities? Bow down and worship me, and they'll all be yours. I'll give you a kingdom right now. It'll all be yours. Well, you know, Jesus knew right away they were the devils to give. <laughs> you, you don't lie to the Son of God at a time like that. See, Satan had rebelled many, many, you know, many, many years before. He had rebelled, and one-third of the angels of heaven went with Satan, and they were cast down. They were defeated by God and cast down. And so they have but a short time. And so he he, he meets the Son of God, and he, he he's desperate to try to, deceive him and he says look look at all these things he was basically saying i have it within my power to give you these things i had a good friend who was a an evangelist and i'm not going to tell you all of what he told me but he, he 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 came to a situation in his life where the devil actually came to him in a in a vision while he was driving his car and it seemed like just time stood still. He was driving down the road. He didn't even know he was driving. And the devil said to him, if you do this thing for me, if you will preach this sermon for me and go that direction, I will make you a very famous man. I will give you great riches. And I asked the evangelist, I said, was the devil lying to you? He said, oh, no, no, no. He was telling the truth. I said, what did you do? He said, well, here I am. <laughs> I, I, I knew I could not go what, do what the devil wanted or I would be lost. 
So I you know, said, get thee behind me, Satan, just like Jesus did. I did not want to be lost for all eternity. I knew I had my chance right then. And I wondered, he said, how many other evangelists, how many other pastors of huge mega churches have, have faced the same decision? How many have come upon Satan at one time in their life and he said, follow me and I will give you all these things. And they, they did it. They went with Satan. Well, today we're going to talk about the worst murderers and revolutionaries on earth in the last 2000 years. Two millennia. Maybe we'll go over two millennia, 15 or 16 years. You know, I, I wanted to make a list for you. I felt you deserved it. You know, that was the title of this talk today. The worst murderers and revolutionaries of the last 2,000 years. And I said, well, I've got to have a list of these men. And I started writing down their names and doing research on them. And, well, pretty soon my research just got huge and page after page. That's why I, <laughs> I can't talk about all the. I've only got 50 minutes or so. I, I, I can't talk about all these men. I'll have to just pick the worst ones. So, uh, of the, you know, the worst of the worst. So I, I scratched out this name, that name, that name, that name. I got, that's still too big. And then I realized John was right. We lie in, in wickedness. And uh, Paul echoed John when he said that Satan is God. That's a small g, by the way. <laughs> God is God of this world. Satan is God of this world. These people that I'm going to tell you about today, this is my opinion. They may not be the worst. There are others that are just as, just as evil. But I'm going to tell you about some of these, and I'm going to try to figure out in my own mind what motivated these men to do such horror. Now, we know about people like John Wayne Gacy killed, what, 33 young boys homosexual, or we know about uh, 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 Jeffrey Dahmer, who killed young boys and, and, and men and, and literally ate part of their bodies, kept their heads in his refrigerator, but but I, I don't want to talk about those people, those, those people are maniacs, they, they are psychopaths, but all these people are psychopaths, now listen, I want to tell you something about a psychopath, a psychopath is not like you and I. Now, there are many flavors of human beings. Some are good, some are bad, some are indifferent. But a psychopath is, let me just say it, he is or she is not a human being. They're a different species than we are. You cannot get in their heads. I've seen these psychopaths, and when they've been put on trial and and convicted, then they the judge allows the, the, the next of kin of the victims, the families, to come up and to have their say. And usually the family says something like this. The family member, let's say the mother or the, the daughter of somebody who was killed by the psychopath or raped and killed or whatever, will say, I just want to know why you did it. I want to know why you killed my brother or my mother or my sister. Or what I want to know why you did it. That's a dumb question. Oh, I know it's a heart-rending question. I, I know it means a lot to that person, but the, 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 the psychopath, doesn't answer it. I've never heard a psychopath answer it. Go back to all your trials. You'll find the psychopath just stands there impassively. No emotion. Let me tell you something, my friends. The psychopath is getting his kicks. The psychopath is enjoying listening to you moan and groan and cry and whine over your lost one. He's reliving in his mind what he did and enjoying it. Why did he do it? He did it because he could do it. He's a monster. He's a species. You know, <laughs> we owned a little cat here in the ministry. We love that cat. Now we got another cat. That cat died of old age, I suppose. We got another cat now. And one day this cat, you know, we let it go outside and then it always come back by the end of the day, <laughs> right here to the office. And we let it in. Next day it'd want to go out again. It'd go out and play and it would catch mice and crickets and kill all of them and birds. Oh, that, oh, that, that cat would catch those birds. And one day this beautiful bird was caught by the, the cat 
And somebody said, oh, the cat's a, just a killer. Why, why does a cat do that? Why does a cat want to kill the bird? Not only does he want to kill the bird, he wants to torture it, torment it. Well, that's a cat's temperament. That's what a cat does. The bigger cats, of course, the lions and the tigers, the leopards. <laughs> you don't want to be around those creatures. But he's such a loving cat. He's, he's so friendly to me. Yes, he is. But don't think for a moment he's not a killer. <laughs> I love cats, by the way. <laughs> it's hard to choose between dogs and cats. I think I like dogs a little better, but yeah, cats are really nice, too. I'm not against cats. Don't get me wrong. But th they follow their natural instincts, and these mass murderers do, too. That's why they do it. Now, a psychopath has no empathy. You know what empathy is? It means you feel sorry for somebody. You can feel their pain. You, you understand the suffering they're going through. And, and it, you just feel like it's, it's you being tormented and tortured. And you don't want that to happen to any human being because you can imagine it happening to you. And you have such empathy, such sympathy for the poor creature that's being tormented. But not the psychopath. I understand when you feel that way because you're, you're a human being. And if you if you're a Christian human being, God puts it in your heart to be soft, to be compassionate. Sometimes Christians just aren't they don't seem to get upset about anything. I get angry. Come on, get upset. Come on, let's wake up. <laughs> get get angry at sin. Get angry at the devil, people. Come on, come on. And they're just sort of soft hearted. I I think God made many of us that way. I get my mail here, so many soft hearts. I know people are sick. They're sick and tired of what's going on in this country, and they won't change, and they write to me, and but still, they're compassionate. I know you are, and I, I get your letters, and I, you know, <laughs> I'm very sympathetic to you, and I know you are toward me, too. And that's way the way we are as Christians. But listen, these people have no feelings whatsoever. And when they deceive people, they they love that. They enjoy that. That's their game. And it's never the victim's fault. Excuse me, the murderer's fault. It's, all, it's always the victim's fault. Now, let me give you some of the idea of the kind of people that I chose for the worst murderers and revolutionaries of the last 2,000 years. Lenin, Trotsky, of course, Marx was their teacher. We'll cover Marx, too. The French Revolution around the end of the 1700s or early 1800s, Robespierre was one of the men there. There's, of course, the Jesuits in Loyola. He wasn't as bad, of course, as Torquemada. Who's Torquemada? Well, he was the, the Inquisition head. He was the guy who put Christians on the rack, tortured them. Most of them died from the torture, of course. He killed a lot of witches, of course. He claimed they were witches. Then, of course, there was Mao Zedong, trying to bring in a lot of modern-day people. Mao Zedong of Red China. There was Pol Pot. He was a Cambodian. He, he admired Mao Zedong and wanted to follow in his footsteps. And so he went about to kill and kill and kill. I don't have a name, but there were the torturers at Nuremberg. Remember the trial at Nuremberg, Justice at Nuremberg, that movie? Well, it didn't tell you the truth. Most of the people who testified, who confessed, did so under extreme torture. See, you just saw when they came up and gave their testimony or whatever, and, and or they had these long statements they had signed, you didn't know that they had horrible things done to them. And, of course, being tortured, they willingly signed their death warrant, didn't they? But who were the torturers? It was uh, uh, Americans, Russians, British, almost all Jews. There was Bernard Baruch. Ah, he was a New York rich man, many millions of dollars. He developed a plan called the Margenthal Plan for Germany. Oh, yes, <laughs> it was how to help Germany recover all right. Some two to three million or more people went to their graves because of the Morgenthau plan and the American soldiers enforced it. The war was already over, but nevertheless, 
Read about the Morgenthau plan and see if I'm not correct. Of course, World War II on the other side, if you, if you've read the book, uh, uh, by, uh, Thomas Goodrich, Hellstorm. Of course, there was the Armenian genocide happened in the early 1900s. An entire nation wiped out, except for, you know, several hundred thousand people. Armenia, a Christian nation, the, the oldest Christian nation, I understand. I've met many Armenian people. They're wonderful people, a sweet people, have a great disposition, and are they ever intelligent? I was invited to speak to a Armenian group, and I love those people. I, I could not imagine how many of them had their hands cut off, their heads cut off, and they were massacred by the Turks. But it wasn't really the Turks. It was the Jews who masqueraded as the young Turks and took over the government of the Ottoman Empire and then went forth to kill and kill and kill. There was, of course, the makers of the atomic bomb, Mr. Oppenheimer. He was a monster. He was a Hindu Jew. Can you imagine that, a Hindu Jew? We'll tell you about him. But he saw to the killing of hundreds of thousands. You see, these people don't deal in small numbers. That's why I didn't choose John Wayne Gacy or Jeff Dahmer. These people are monsters, and they're empowered by governments, by states, to kill. You know, I used to teach a block of instruction to my officer candidates when I was in officer training programs. I was the the instructor or the professor. I taught a block of instruction about terrorism. I said the worst kind of terrorists are the state-sponsored terrorists. The state-sponsored terrorists. Of course, I didn't know then that the United States was the leader of that horrible group, but it is. So let's talk about some of these gentlemen, shall we call them? You know, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, God declares, all those who hate me love death. Have you ever wondered why the Democratic Party and all these liberals aren't phased at all by what's happening at Planned Parenthood? Thousands and thousands of little babies torn apart. They're alive. They're taken out of the womb. They can breathe. They're living beings, but... They kill them in the womb. Sometimes they take out a part of the body and kill it, and then the rest of it comes out. Then they sell the body parts. These are monsters, you see. But, oh, oh, the Democrats will defend them, and how dare you cut off government money to this wonderful group, Planned Parenthood. Oh, oh, those videos were doctored, even though forensic scientists researched the videos and said they're truthful. They're there. There's a woman saying it. She's laughing about it. One of the doctors was laughing about it, and, and, and in the video, she's, she says, after I take out the brain, I love to take out the little hearts. It's so cute. Huh? I love to cut out the heart of the little baby. It's so cute to have a little beating heart in my hand, I suppose is what she meant. How ghoulish, how monstrous is that statement? It's so cute to take a little baby's tiny heart and rip it out of its chest. Oh, my goodness. And yet, our Congress has just approved $540 million to go to Planned Parenthood, and they will kill more little babies and, and, and take more little baby parts, and they'll be laughing about it. <laughs> the Christians didn't get what they wanted, did they? We're going to keep killing these babies. I saw a column by a woman, uh, a national column in the New York Times, other newspapers, a, a, a liberal writer, and she said she doesn't know what's wrong with Christians. We should be joyful at abortion. It's a wonderful procedure. Wow. I have a book here in my library by a witch, a witch from France. She says in, in witchcraft, abortion is a religious ritual. We celebrate. 
as we abort. Wow. They have no morals. They have no compunction against murder. They celebrate. Can you imagine? No, you can't imagine. No, no, don't tell me that you, you, you can get in their minds. Don't tell me you can figure out the anatomy uh, uh, of the brain of the psychopath of these monsters in the liberal Democrat Party. Don't even tell me you can think. You can't imagine how evil and wicked they are. You can't. During the French Revolution, the last dictator in power, they went over a number during that revolution, was Robespierre. Now, they had around 25 million Frenchmen. That was the population of France. But they said, we have too many people. We need to thin the population. And they planned to kill a good percent of the population. Now, what they would do is they would go to a town or a village that was Christian, and you know most of the people were Christians, and they would say, we've been sent here by the government to help you. We want to protect those of you who are Christians. So you're required to come down to the city square, and we're going to have some tables there, and you must register as Christians. That's the only way we can protect you. We need to know who the Christians are. And so all the Christians would go and register. And what they were doing was signing their death warrant because they were immediately arrested, taken out, and murdered. How, how did they murder these Christians? They would take 20 or 30 at a time, put them in a boat, tie their hands and their feet, put them in a boat, and send them out into the river, the Seine River. And there these poor Christians were, their hands tied, their feet tied, all sitting cramped in this boat. They were pushed out into the water, into the deep water. And what would happen next? Well, the murderers would shoot the boat. That was their great joy. Not killing the people, but seeing them suffer as the boat had holes in it and slowly began to get to, to take on water and began to sink. The Christians would realize we're going to drown. We have no way out. And they loved to hear the screaming and the hollering and the crying. They loved it. Of course, there were other great murderers too. I mean, I can't even tell you about the horrible things they did rip out fingernails, tear out people's gouge their eyes out. Horrible things. Mainly to Christians because Voltaire said, let's crush the wretch. He meant Jesus, of course. Let us crush the wretch. And so millions died. But they were going to do this all over Europe. They had just begun when, of course, Napoleon came along and Establish his kingdom, his empire. What happened to Robespierre, the monster? What happened to him? The, the last dictator of, uh, during the French Revolution well, before Napoleon, what happened to him? Well, he died too, you see. His head was chopped off. Many of their heads were chopped off. And remember the, 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 the queen, Antoinette, Marie Antoinette? They said, oh, she's a terrible person. She said, when she was told of the starving peasants, she said, let them eat cake. She never said that. Read your history books. She was a kind and generous young lady. And she was only 21 years of age. 21 years of age. By the way, her last words have been recorded in history. As she was taken up, to the gallows on the steps and the, the hangman with his noose was there waiting for her and he lifted, brought her hand up and pulled her up toward the guillotine. She accidentally stepped on his foot. Her last words were, pardon me, I did not mean it. Oh, she was a cruel woman, wasn't she? And when her head was chopped off, and went into the basket, the people roared their approval. That's what the people do, you see. 
when when Christians, when good people are murdered, the people roar their approval. When Jesus was was sent to the cross, the people were happy. And when Jesus wasn't going to be sent to the cross, they figured they were very upset about it. They said, give us Barabbas. Away with this Jesus. Crucify him. And Jesus said, if they do this to me, they will do it to you too. They will kill you and think they do God's service. One of the monsters I want to tell you about is a man named Solomon Morell. Solomon Morell. Who is Solomon Morell? Well, he was a Polish man. Jonathan Sack, a Jew, wrote a book about Solomon Morell and others. The book is entitled An Eye for an Eye. We offered it in the ministry, and unfortunately it's out of print now, and I can understand why. Jonathan Sack died, and they put his book out of print because the Jews don't want you to know what happened. After World War II, concentration camps continued to function. But now they were putting the Germans in it. Oh, not no, no, you, oh, they, you think they're putting the concentration camp guards in there? No, no. They're putting men, women, children, old men, little babies. Solomon Morell was commandant of one of the concentration camps after the end of World War II in 1945 to 1948 in Poland. One witness said he took a baby out of the arms of a crying German woman. Her only crime was she was a German. And they took her house from her and they brought her to this concentration camp. And Solomon Morell met all of the Germans as they came there. He, he met them. And he said, I'm Solomon Morell. I'm your commandant. You have come here to die. That's what he told them. You have come here to die. And he took this little baby's both legs and he grabbed them with, in his, in, inside his hands and he slung the baby. And the baby's head was smashed against a wooden door. And, of course, blood flew everywhere. The baby was dead. And Solomon Morell, Solomon Morell laughed. He was a monster. He was a murderer and a revolutionary. He was a Jew and a communist. By the way, Solomon Morell is still alive today. He, he's still alive today. You see, in Poland, after the Soviet Union fell, Solomon Morell felt maybe he was going to be tried for all those crimes he had done. So he fled to Israel. Now, Israel has hidden all of these people. Yeah, he lives there in, in, in Israel in Tel Aviv, Solomon Morell, the monster. And Israel protects him. They protect all of the monsters that operated all of the concentration camps after World War II. Oh, you didn't know about that, did you? The, the, the concentration camps that operated after World War II. The Americans were in charge of many of them. Eisenhower hated the Germans. And up to three million Germans died as a result of Eisenhower, but particularly because of the Morgenthau plan. The plan that we had for Germany, implemented by Bernard Baruch, by Morgenthau, who was Secretary of the Treasury under Harry Truman. Okay, we're going to take a break now. When we come back, we're going to look at some other mass murderers. Oppenheimer of the atomic bomb. Lenin, Trotsky. But first, we're going to look at Karl Marx, a man that loved the poor. Oh, yes, he did. We'll tell you about the poetry of Karl Marx when we return. I'm Tex Mars. You're listening to Power of Prophecy. Conspiracy World, a truth teller's compendium of eye-opening revelations and forbidden knowledge. You know, I wrote Conspiracy World several years ago, and I was just reading again the last couple of days, and, and I thought, you know, how you know, perceptive uh, that I was. God gave me all this information, 
many years of research, many dozens of articles about the Illuminati, the global conspiracy, and these mass murderers. It starts off in page one with uh, an article entitled Revolution of Blood. And there's a picture of Vladimir Lenin sitting in uh, a hospital bed. And look at his eyes. They're the eyes of a maniac. They said that during his last days, he lost his mind. His nurse would wheel him out in his wheelchair to the balcony, and he would look out into the valleys below, and he would howl like a wolf. Oh! That was the destiny. That's how Lennon ended his life. You see, the doctors say he was ravaged by syphilis, a sexual disease. And that strange look in his eyes is because his brain had rotted out. I, I believe that that was 1923. That was only six years after the Communist Revolution. And it, he turned over the whole empire, of course, to a worse madman than he, if that were possible, Joseph Stalin. <sighs> By the way, Lenin's mausoleum, you know where they put his body? Where, where Russians even go today to worship Lenin. He's like a god, even though he said he didn't believe in a god, he did. He, he, he did all those horrible things for the Jewish gods. Did you notice I said gods? That's right, there are multiple gods in Judaism. His mausoleum, Lenin's mausoleum, and I point this out in Conspiracy World, this fabulous book, is the Pergamon Museum. The Pergamon Temple. You know, the Bible talks about Pergamos, a city in Greece. And it's interesting that in the book of Revelation, it talks about Pergamos as being the seat where Satan dwells, the seat of Satan. Wow. Did, did you know that Satan has a throne on earth? And at that time, it was in Pergamos in Greece. It was a Babylonian temple. I have a picture of it in a new book I'm going to be coming out with in about three more months entitled Dark Citadel. Right now, though, I want you to know that I, on page 17 of Conspiracy World, I tell you that in Russia, they built a model, a, a replica of the Babylonian temple in Pergamos, the seat where Satan dwells. And there... They have, well, I guess it's a pickled or petrified body of linen. They, they, they keep it in a, a, a big glass contraption, a glass coffin. And as you go by, you can see there's linen. He, he looks as good as he did when he was freshly alive. They say every so often they take the body out, empty all of that gunk, put new material. I, I don't know what it is. Some say they, they studied the ancient e Egyptian, you know, King Tut and all the others, and uh, their bodies were kept so well, and they were given all these spices and things. By the way, this same mausoleum, this Babylonian temple, that was uh, still exists in ruins today in Pergamon, in Pergamos in Greece, Somebody told me recently that they had gone to North Vietnam to visit. And the taxi driver said, would you, he went to uh, you know, Ho Chi Minh City, I believe it was, the, the capital. And the taxi driver said, sir, would you like me to take you to Ho Chi Minh? That's the, the leader during the Vietnam War years. Ho Chi Minh's mausoleum? Remember now, Ho Chi Minh was a communist. And so the Americans said, yeah, I'd like to go see his mausoleum, you know. The, he, he thought he would see, you know, like, like in China, you know, they have the big buildings, you know, that look so ornate and all with all of their, you know. <laughs> but when he got there, when they got there, it was a Babylonian mausoleum. It, it was the temple of Pergamon. And there it was, right in the capital of, of Vietnam. And Ho Chi Minh's body is housed there. 
the communist. It seems to me the communist Jews who founded communism knew what they were doing, don't you think, friends? I mean, the the the, the temple of Pergamon, where God said that's the seat of Satan, is now the mausoleum, the the final resting place for Lenin and for Ho Chi Minh. Oh, there's more though. My goodness gracious! I went to Washington D.C. and there I visited the house of the temple. Exactly 13 blocks from the White House. And I was told the house of the temple is built just like the temple in Pergamos. I went in and they showed me the sanctuary. And, and behind the, the granite, the black granite altar were huge golden serpents on the wall. What is this? I thought. And then they said the wonderful thing about the house of the temple of international Freemasonry right here in Washington, D.C., is that it is the final resting place, the mausoleum, for our great sovereign grand commander, Albert Pike. They have his body there at the house in the mausoleum. Oh, my. Those Masons know what they're doing, don't they? Now, Remember I said that Isaiah says, all those who hate me love death. And that the Freemason Voltaire in France in 1798 during the French Revolution said, our real object is to crush the wretch. That's their real object. You know, pornography is a big thing in America today. Pornography. The Jews seem to control it all and run it all and have all of these horrible films and snuff films and uh, television uh, websites and so forth. And, and one of the, the worst people is, is a Jew who, just a horrible Jew who, who did a lot of these things and produced a lot of these movies. And they said, why, why did you get involved in pornography? He said, let me tell you one reason, one reason only, because I hate Christianity. And the more of these dirty movies I did, the more I, 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 I believed that I was just digging into Christianity. He did it. He produces pornography out of a hatred for Christianity. What, what, who would have thought such a thing? Of course, the devil is a fickle master. Robespierre, who I told you about, who was Jewish, by the way, Frenchman, he was beheaded himself. He beheaded others, and he himself was beheaded. Doesn't the Bible say in Revelation chapter 13, He who lives by the sword shall die by the sword? Of course, the Freemasons say, and this was the goals of, of, the, of the French Illuminist. And by the way, I didn't even tell you about another monster, the, the, the founder of, of the Illuminati in 1776. The goal of the Illuminati was liberty, equality, fraternity. Why? Isn't that what Hillary Clinton's claiming now? Equality for women? Oh, yes. Let me tell you a little bit of things that happened in France. During this time of liberty, equality, and fraternity, Protestant ministers and Catholic priests had their eyes gouged out. Many were shot, others bayoneted, still others stomped to death or killed with a sword. Crazed rioters tore many to pieces. Of course, Queen Antoinette and France's uh, king, Louis the Sixteenth, were beheaded. And the lies are still told about this man, although he was a very kind king. Across France, over three million people perished. Many of them small merchants, shop owners, simple farmers. Most were God-fearing persons. Entire towns were razed and destroyed. And the Illuminists went in every church and defaced it and did horrible things to the church. They did their uh, acts of urine and the other 
act of nature. They broke all the windows inside, especially the beautiful uh, stained glass windows. And they ripped all of the curtains up and they would even have a sex act. They would take one of the women and rip her clothes off and they would gang rape her on top of the altar. They destroyed the pews and they would rip the cross off the wall and urinate on it. Oh, yes, indeed. Voltaire was right. Our real object is to crush the rich. And, you know, Gorbachev said in Russia, the French Revolution is our pattern. The French Revolution is our pattern. And, and indeed, in 1917, they did this in Russia. Lenin was in charge, Trotsky with his deputy, and somewhere down the line was Stalin, who became the big honcho after Lenin died, just six years later. But Lenin was indeed a monster. In the book Under the Sign of the Scorpion, written by Jerry Lena, the author uh, used a, a freshly unearthed historical archives from Russia to explain the, the Red Terror, because that's what took Russia, the Red Terror. Now, Lenin's own wife, Nadezhda Krupskaya, she wrote a book called Memoirs in 1932 that told all about it. She said Lenin would, for his enjoyment, for his personal time, when he wanted to be by himself, he would row a little boat. There was a little island in the Yenisei River where many rabbits had migrated. They call it the Rabbit Island, Rabbit, R-A-B-B-I-T. And Lennon would row this boat over there. For his own sick pleasure, the cruel Lennon would club rabbits to death. He would chase all over that island, clubbing rabbits to death. They said he would club so many rabbits to death with the butt of his rifle. He didn't, didn't even shoot him. He wanted to club them. He wanted us to hear the thud of the, the rifle butt. But one time, so many rabbits were in the boat that the boat actually sank. It was so full of dead rabbits. Lennon, they said, was drunk. That's what his wife said. He became drunk with glee at the awful sight. Can you imagine getting drunk on seeing dead creatures, dead animals? To help in the killing, Lennon mobilized 1,400,000 Jews, all the Jews. And he brought many Jews from all over the world. Many United States Jews went there, too, to build a great new Republic, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Many of them went to work for the Cheka secret police. One of the things he ordered the Cheka to do is execute weapons owners. Remember that, folks. <laughs> you don't care much for the Second Amendment. Well, you will care for it. Execute the weapon owners. By the way, one other category of person was to be killed, too. Anyone who wore a school cap, you see, they had little school uniforms, all the students in Russia, they had little caps on. You could identify all the students. That that was only for a, a few days, though, because Lenin said, go out and look for the students wearing the caps and murder them, kill them. They said that one of Lenin's assistant loaded his wagon up with caps of students that he had murdered. And he, he drove his wagon, pulled his wagon up to the Kremlin, and he got out and said, Comrade Lenin, look at all the students I have killed for you. And Lenin laughed and cackled. The tongues of churchmen were cut off, hands were sawn off, heads were drilled with dental tools, and those nearby were forced to eat their brains, eat the brains of the dead. Then they too were executed. Whole families were arrested and killed. Mothers were brutally raped and killed. Children and fathers watching. The Volga and other rivers ran red with blood. And you know what Lenin did? <laughs> he, he sent out a letter. And it was to, to all of the, the red Jews in, in the country. And it said, put more force into the terror. The Russian Jewish newspaper on August 24, 1922, said Lenin had asked Russia's chief rabbis if they were satisfied 
with the particularly cruel executions meted out to Christian clergy and Christian followers. Are you satisfied with this, he said, rabbis? And then, just a year later in 1923, with syphilis ravaging his mind, an ailing Vladimir Lenin sat out on his balcony and howled at the full moon like a wolf. Boy. Now, Stalin saw that millions were purged, many millions more taken from their homes. He needed slave labor to build canals and subways. And so Stalin, of course, operated the KGB and all of its chambers of horror. Uh, they, they said there's one building in Moscow that people pass there today, lower their head in shame when they walk by. They said in the basement of that building, and it was a huge building, they said it was so full of blood. It, it was it was past the soles of the soldiers' shoes. They brought people in there, and, and people would cry out, please, please let me talk to Comrade Stalin. He'll understand I'm not guilty. One prison guard said, it's not a matter of your being guilty. You're here. You're going to die. But I've done nothing wrong. But we have to have our quota, he said. They had a quota. The next morning, they had to report to their commissar bosses how many they'd killed. If they didn't kill enough, they would die. It doesn't matter whether you're guilty or not. We have to kill you. We have a quota. Pol Pot in Cambodia was a communist, the Khmer Rouge, the red communist. And Pol Pot told all of his bloody uh, soldiers, the peasant soldiers, he said, kill everyone with an education. They said, everyone? Yes. Go through all the records and find everyone who graduated from a middle school, you know, the American equivalent of a middle school, the eighth grade, ninth grade, and kill them. I won't know college graduates alive. I, I won't know one who's finished a high school alive. And so they went forth. At first, they cried out, is there anyone here that has a high school diploma? And Many of them thought, yes, they're going to use me. They're going to, I, I'm going to be given a job. I'm going to be given a, a position maybe. And they would raise their hands. Yes, I graduated from my high school. They said, come and get in the truck. They thought they were going to be taken away somewhere and be used. Oh, yeah, the, the truck was taken away. And the 20 or 30 people in the back of the truck, where they were taken away out uh, outside the city about 10 miles to, to a field. And there they were all shot. Until they ran out of bullets, and then they used to use the butt of the rifles. Some would say, why am I being killed? Why? Why? And the Cambodian soldiers had a phrase they used. The company told us to do it. The company. You're, you're, you're going to die because the company said so. Wow. What went through Pol Pot's mind? How could he have killed they, they say that Cambodia had some four and a half million people and two and a half million died. What went through his mind? Well, in Armenia, the beginning of the 20th century, that nation also had about four and a half million people, they said. And up to a million and a half were murdered. Well, one day the Turks just came in and they'd been friends and many Armenians were in the government and they had a small little country there that bordered on one side was Russian, on the other side was Turkey. And they, they, they never got into war with anybody. They're very friendly, but the Turkish soldiers came in one time and said, our leaders have told us you must all leave. Well, where, where will we go? They said, we have a place for you in Syria. You're going to march there. Oh, surely not, they said. I mean, how is it possible we could get all the way to Syria just walking on our feet? The soldiers said, come or you die. And they took many and killed them right away. And, of course, all the people left. And they said, leave your things here. Take no clothes. Take no, 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 no jewelry. Take nothing with you. No food, nothing. And some men said, that's hundreds of miles over very rugged land, uh, 
uh, some places almost don't even have a road. How can we possibly make it? We look, our grandfather, he's 70, 80 years old. How, how my mother, my grandmother, how, how can they possibly make it? You die. And they were killed right then. And so they all got on the road. Hundreds of thousands, stragglers. Now along the way, they were killed. Most of them were killed as they traveled. You see, the Turks, Turkish soldiers were not interested at all in them getting there. What motivated the Turkish soldiers? Their hatred for the Christians. See, most of them were Muslims. But their leaders were Jews. They call them the Young Turks. Read about the Young Turks that took over Turkey. They were actually Jews from Salonika in Greece. The British consul was notified of these horrors that were going on, and he, he was ordered by his government to check out and investigate. And he took some of his uh, countrymen with him, and they went down to the, uh, to, to, the, to the road where all of these people were straggling down, and he looked, and he saw a sight that he had never beheld in his life. Along the road, where all of these people were going down the road, struggling to make one more step, he saw human bodies, human bodies, one after another, dead, killed by the soldiers. And then he saw something, and he said, what is that? It's a hand. There's thousands of hands. that They actually had their hands cut off, and they bled to death. Think about that. At the wrist. The Turkish soldiers were so cruel they would cut off the hands of the Armenians, men, women, children. And they would try to take their clothes off and wrap their, 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 their limbs so that they wouldn't bleed, but naturally they bled to death. That was the method of dying. He said, I saw so many hands that if laid side by side on a road, the road could have been over a thousand miles in length. I saw these hands, human hands. Now, let's talk about Manhattan, the Manhattan Project, completed, of course, down in Alamogordo, New Mexico. A Jew was put in charge of that, a Jewish scientist named Oppenheimer. And when the first atomic bomb blew up that they had, you know, experimented with, and he saw the incredible blaze, he was, of course, miles away, and they he, he saw this incredible mushroom cloud going up he said something he said i have become the destroyer of worlds think about that oppenheimer said i have become the destroyer of worlds now that quote was said before it was said in the bhagavad gita the hindu scriptures it is the words of the great God of the Hindus, Krishna. I have become the destroyer of worlds, said the God of the Hindus. And there Oppenheimer, a Jew, was declaring that he had become the destroyer of worlds. Now these Jews and the French Revolution, they were basically communists although we didn't call it communism at the time. But around 1838, the communists came forth, and Karl Marx became their leader with his writings. Now, did he write for the people? Was it really power to the people that Lenin once said was his motto? Let me read to you. I'm reading from the book Marx and Satan by Pastor Richard Vermbrand. Vermbrand should know about Marx and Satan because he was tortured for Christ in a communist prison in Romania. And he, he, he writes on page 15, he quotes Karl Marx, a, a, a drama, a play that Karl Marx wrote called Olenem, O-U-L-A-N-E-M. Now, what is the meaning of Olenem? Well, according to Pastor Vermbren, it's an inversion of the holy name Emmanuel a biblical name of Jesus, which means in Hebrew, God with us. Well, Marx decided to turn it around. 
the inversion of a name is pretty effective, they say in black magic. So he named it Olenem. Listen, this is like a confession, a confession in a poem that Marx wrote. The hellish vapors rise and fill the brain, wrote Marx, till I go mad and my heart is utterly changed. See this sword? The prince of darkness sold it to me. For me, he beats the time and gives the signs. Even more boldly, I play the dance of death. Hmm. He knew what he was starting. The devils had no, no doubt told Marx how important a man that he would become. And he would be quoted by communists throughout the world. Now let me read you the end of Olenem, the end of it. He wrote a poem called Invocation of One in Despair. He said, I wish to avenge myself against the one who rules above. Ah, oh, that's what he was doing. He hated God. I wish to avenge myself, wrote Marx, against the one who rules above. If there is a something which devours, I'll leap within it. Though I bring the world to ruins, the world which bulks between me and the abyss, I will smash to pieces with my enduring curses. I'll throw my arms around its harsh reality. Embracing me, the world will dumbly pass away and then sink down to utter nothingness perished with no existence. That would be really living. He says, if I could, I would attack the sun, deprive the universe of it. I would use it to set the world on fire. These would be real crimes. Think of that. He would attack the sun. He said, I would like to split the planet hinder its process, stop the circle of stars, overthrow the globes that float in space, destroy what serves nature, protect what harms in it. I, I wish to insult it in my works. These would be real crimes. He knew there would be crimes, and he would be the author of it. Well, we've talked a lot then about murders. What do they have in common? They have no sympathy, no empathy for human beings. They gloat. They delight in the torment of others. And we have them in America, the Democrats and Republicans who have now funded Planned Parenthood. Are they not monsters? Are they not equally as guilty as Bernard Brook, as Anton LaVey, the head of the Church of Satan, as Lenin, Trotsky, Marx? <sighs> Are they not a different species than you and I? Do they not also wish they had the power to take down the globes, the stars? Would they not, if they, they had the power and, and could do so, express as Marx did, these are real crimes? Now, this is really living. Wow. I believe because they don't have Jesus in their heart. I believe because they have the holy serpent. They call it holy. It's the devil serpent. It's the dragon. His name is Satan. To order Conspiracy World or Marks and Satan and our other fine books, simply go to our website, powerofprophecy.com, or call 1-800-234-9673. You can also write to us, of course, and that would be Power of Prophecy, 1708 Patterson Road, Austin, Texas, 78733. This is Tex Mars, my friends. You've been listening to Power of Prophecy. Tune in each week during the same time. Tune in and discover the power of prophecy.